Hi, uh, this is Mitch Weisberg. I was on a little bit earlier for you early birds. And it still is, I guess, about a minute early, but that does mean we can't get started. Uh, I see a, a bunch of you are here and a few of you have clicked on icons of, of other people. And I want to talk a little bit about EdChat Interactive because we have another event coming up in June. And even though I haven't posted it yet, we have some great events coming up in, in July. Our goal is to give educators a chance to talk to each other about some of the great things that they're doing in education. And we think that if with educators talking to each other, that we can all move the bar upwards and, and or move the ball forwards in education and allow kids to grow up to be fully functioning adults in this 20, 21st century that we're living in right now. So we started at Chat Interactive because we just didn't think that a typical webinar could do that. And uh, we're really happy that, that you joined us here. And Mitch, if you could just maybe pick two or three people to share. Go ahead, Alan. Alan, are you there? Sorry, Alan had said, um, I, I texted Alan, and before he could reply, I put him up. But he says he's observing. So um, so I didn't really want to put him, put him up to that. So I'm going to look for somebody else. And... Um, See if I can bring them up. Um... Hello, Julie. Hello, Julie. Hello. I'm just please, really please, observing. Please. Yeah, I'm just really observing too. I was not in the meeting last week, and so um, I really wanted to just listen and see what y'all were talking about today new to this. Yeah. Have you uh, ever played a digital game before? No, not, well, no, not in the classroom for sure. <laughs> what games have you played what outside, you played outside of the classroom? Oh, I'm rather old. I guess I've played the old type of games. I'm not really into the new gaming systems. I did have a Wii for my children, but that was it. Oh, uh, the Wii. Did you ever play Did you ever Wii, play sports? Wii sports games? A few of those. Not very much. Mostly the Wii dance, believe it or not. <laughs> Absolutely those Absolutely games. Absolutely those games. Uh, they're filled with, with embedded math. I teach 8th grade math, um, the algebra and pre-algebra. And I would have to... I'm still toying with the idea of how I would have be able to give time for this in the classroom. That's why I wanted to listen to this and see how people were using it. All right, well, thank you very well, much. Thank for you very much for being brave. Being All right, Mitch. Uh, next, let's go ahead and do. Two more slides ahead to slide seven, please. Perfect, right there. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, folks, for sh uh, sharing. Uh, I know it's a little bit uh, <laughs> of putting on the, um, you know, in the spotlight, in the hot seat, but I appreciate it. Um, and you can see that even games like Nintendo Wii games, like Wii Sports, has a lot of, of like potential, a lot of embedded math. Um, one of my friends, or two of my friends, uh, Matthew uh, Winner and Megan Hearn wrote a book for ISTE called uh, Use Math for Grades, I think it's K through seven. Uh, and in that it talks about all of the just different embedded math skills that are in the game, uh, talks about the different games and all that. Uh, it's uh, available through um, the ISTE uh, bookstore. Uh, but it's another wonderful book that actually shows you you can take something like a commercial video game and make it into a teachable moment. Um, and she would bring Wii's into the classroom and play, and there's absolutely time to do it because, well, they're, they are actually doing math. Uh, and it's a fun type of math.
uh, because it's it's real world, and of course they get to play along with it as their motivation and their engagement right there. Um, finding the appropriate uh, video game for instruction is a crucial step, of course, in initiating the digital game-based learning experience. There are any number of consoles, and we even mentioned the Wii, um, and there's also other types of interfaces that buy digital games for students. So finding the right match is critical. Next. Um, so what I'd like you to do right now is I'd like you to brainstorm what game platforms or delivery methods exist uh, to help uh, you know bring the games into the classrooms for students. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to do your I am feature. If you uh, see your um, face, mine's on the right hand side, you probably see that there's like a little I am icon. If you could go in there and just list one type of game platform uh, that's available for students, uh, we'll just take about a minute uh, for you to hopefully share. Excellent. I see, uh, of course, the Wii DS games. Uh, in Japan, they the DS games to help uh, uh, museum visits, and they also had the uh, them enter schools, too. Uh, one of the head programmers at Nintendo, um, Japanese fellow, I can't pronounce his name um, off the top of my head, but he uh, he helped to initialize that program. Steam. Steam is a browser-based. Um, it, it's a little bit different than service. Uh, you can join and play games uh, through an internet connection. Uh, you do have to be a little careful, though. They don't have the best screening process. Uh, say, for instance, that the Apple App Store and uh, Google Play have. Smart boards, absolutely. Um, places like uh, Smart Technologies, they have um web resources out there to where you can actually build games i see that there's apple app stores that there's google play excellent um so this group is pretty aware of where to get games. um and i'm going to tell you this is that um uh, as i mentioned before my friends uh who used the wii uh in the classroom uh they didn't have to spend a lot of money because as, as i mentioned before uh, Wii is starting to become antiquated now that there's Wii U. Uh, so people have these Wii consoles at home just collecting dust. I have one uh, less than 20 feet away from me in a bin. Uh, they're able to donate them to schools, and as long as they have a TV, they're able to play these games. Uh, you can come up with, you can get like three or four Wii uh, things. You have a wonderful workstation environment for your students to um, play in. Um, so excellent brain. Thank you very much. Um, let's go ahead uh, and I'm going to just close out the uh, IM chat real quick and go on to the next one. And here's some of the ones that I came up with, which I think everybody else came up with. Um, there's first the browser-based games, which we explored last week. Browser-based games are those games that you can simply just go Google, do a Google search and find a lot of free ones. They're usually short-form game, games that are quick to play are easy to search for. Uh, if you are studying recycling with your students, you'll be able to find recycling games. If you want to study math, practice with math skills and get the algorithms down, there's, there's millions and millions of math-based games out there. There's Steam, which I mentioned. There's PC games, which are not as popular now that they have the the app markets, and now that there's the consoles um, and like uh, mobile devices, even like uh, was it the Leapster? Uh, but absolutely, PC games are still around. They're still wonderfully produced, and of course, there's a lot of learning PC games. Uh, there's still Reader Rabbit. I'm sure you could probably find the fifth or sixth edition of the Oregon Trail. Uh, absolutely, are teachable games. The mobile devices, the tablets, the smartphones, and of course the portable game consoles. So now we have an idea of where to get these games, or we have an idea of 
what platforms we can play these games on. Um, but sometimes you have to just figure, what am I going to get? Am I going to go the route and get iPads or get tablets? That's fine. You've now narrowed the view of what you can get for your students. And that's not a bad thing. That's just you have to, unfortunately, you have to stick with a platform so this way you can find games for it. Um, what platform is the best? I would say if I'm starting off, I would say browser-based games um, are definitely the easiest to find. And of course, if I have tablets at the ready, I've got access to, you know, two million apps, one million in app, uh, Apple's App Store, and one million in Google Play. Um, so now that we understand where to play the games, let's move on next to where I start. Um, of course, we are, most of us, I'm not going to say all of us, but most of us teach in a standard-based uh, curriculum. You have to start with the standards. Uh, you're not just going to play games for, not just for fun, <laughs> is hopefully the one of the incentives. You have to start with the, the standards. Now, although I flashed the Common Core State standards up there, that's just what's popular in the news. That's what's really a hot topic in education right now. It's they're not the only set of standards. You, of course, have your district standards. Your uh, if you're from outside of the United States, you have your provincial uh, standards. You have uh, even if you're in Catholic schools, you would have your own curriculums that have a set of standards. Uh, so you would start with content standards because you obviously need to teach. Uh, and play a game that's related and aligned to what you're teaching in the class. Um, so you start with standards. And uh, next, and if you go uh, and see this next slide, uh, here's a snippet from the Common Core uh, examining division. I want you just to take a minute and scan, um, and I can see it pretty clearly. I'm hoping that you can as well. If not, you can always enlarge it uh, with the little icon right at the screen. It's just like YouTube. There you go. Um, and I think Mitch just did it. Mitch is the man. Okay, anyway, uh, just go ahead and read that little snippet real quick. Just take a minute. Um, okay, next, Mitch. So you can see that the main idea of the standard is to practice division problems, uh, the algorithm of the word problems. Um, what it has to do is I want you to take about three to five, let's say four minutes, and I'd like you to play this game. Uh, I include the web address, so if you could just potentially open up a new window and find this game. It is uh, Apple Baskets Division. Uh, the web address is right there bottom of the slide. Just go ahead and enter that web address, or you can even Google search it and find it quickly. I'd like you to go ahead and just take a few minutes and play the game and decide if it meets that content standard. Four minutes starting now. Okay, folks, time is about out. Um, let me see. Time's about up. I'm hoping that by playing that game, you can see that there are some free games that are already out there that do align to the standards. Um, next. So the first step after uh, figuring out what standard you have to teach is really you have to preview games, to determine if the selected standards are explored in the game's content, just like you just did. Uh, it's important not to get discouraged. You have to remember that it's a process. Uh, next, uh, facilitators um, need to pilot gameplay. Um, you have to evaluate the game to observe if it aligns with the learning goals that are being explored during instruction. Uh, one of the true strengths of the education field is the ability for teachers, instructors, facilitators, faculty, and colleagues to collaborate offer suggestions, and refine instructional practices. Um, so it's definitely important to pilot the gameplay. Um, so look at for the learning goals. Find if games are free of cultural bias or controversial content. Um, students should be able to learn how to play on the fly or with very little instruction. So the game should be a good 
teacher of some content. Um, think about how you're going to introduce the game, what instructional events occur for gameplay, and what students are expected to do after the gameplay is over. Uh, so this should really kind of connect into an instruction, you know, um, instructional events. Next. Um, professor Carl Kapp, he is a professor in Bloomsburg, at Bloomsburg University, I think I mentioned him a little bit last week, uh, identified very clearly that there's two types of games. There's testing games and there's teaching games. Of course, the teaching games are the ones that teach or review content. Testing games are the games that assess or test your knowledge. It's important to select games and how you use them in the uh, in the instructional process to use them for you know what they were designed for. For instance, I'm if my students have never used multiplication before, I'm not going to pick a game that's going to rate their abilities uh, because that's not really what the game's designed for. It's, if it's designed for assessment, I don't want to pick that game. If I want them to review or practice, then I might pick a testing game. If I want them to learn something for the first time, I'll pick a teaching game. Uh, that way they'll receive some sort of information or, or instruction or uh, even view some sort of tutorial before they go on to select or create pro or you know complete problems, answer questions, or experience, of course, the challenges in different types of play. That's not just for math. It's not just for a quick answer. It's also for other experiences and long form games, the, the Minecrafts and the long adventure games if you'd ever play like World of Warcraft or something. Next. Um, what I'm making available to you today, um, at the very end, uh, I'm going to have a bunch of takeaways for this, um, for this activity today, uh, is a rubric that will help you plan and prepare for digital game-based learning experiences. Uh, of course, I start with learning comes in pedagogy. Start to think about does the gameplay support the learning objectives and the outcomes? Can you use multiple games during instruction? Maybe one game's not good enough. Maybe multiple games will have to be used. Um, is gameplay realistic and does it involve skills that are useful in the real world? Will the game challenge and evolve, uh, and evolve with player performance? If they if they get better, will the game get more challenging? Is it is the game fun, engaging, and challenging for players? You keep on asking these questions to help make your decision. Next. Also, you want to think, because remember, some of these can be testing games. Does the game contain assessment tools or performance measurements to provide users and instructors with player feedback? We'll talk about analytics in just a second. Um, can the game-based facilitator incorporate reality-based assessment strategies, measuring knowledge attained in play? Can, there, can the teacher be observing? Can the teacher be having them complete some sort of educational artifact after gameplay? reflecting on gameplay, etc. A lot of potential here. And finally, think about the technical aspects. Um, is this going to be a game that you're going to have one-to-one -one computing, for instance, one person for each device? Is this going to be something that's going to be played in a small group? Is it just uh, something that'll be in a workstation? You have to kind of answer these different questions. The game should be appealing. It should be designed in a good manner. Um, it should be cheap. The game controls and manipulation should be transparent, intuitive, and logical for the player. Uh, and of course, the content should be appropriate for the age level of the student. Um, so I will make this rubric available to everybody uh, in this interactive chat today um, at the very end of um, our, our time together. Next. So in preparing for a digital game-based learning environment, try to use flexible spacing. Uh, and in fact, this is something I really try to talk about with my students um, um, as a professor in a school of education. I try to uh, encourage this flexible spacing where you can have small groups easy. Um, if you're going if you're going to be in technology-rich lesson um, mode, you're going to want to have clear lines of sight to 
whatever the student should be looking at, whether it's at their screen, at their device, or to the teacher that's demonstrating something. Uh, versatile furniture, uh, dedicated class meeting area, and of course, uh, easy non-digital transition, where some things you cannot use a digital device, may not be playing the game immediately, you should be able to somehow put that to the side so this way you could have your discussions. So it's a lot of traditional and non-traditional teaching approaches. Next. So to effectively integrate games into primary and secondary classes, educators must see how specific games fit in with their instruction and facilitate important instructional events before and or after gameplay. So it's almost like fitting it in as a piece of the puzzle. So Mario can obviously be uh, as a warm up in event one, he could be something of an event. If you think of lesson plans, it's almost like it's just uh, if you think about lesson plans, it's a bunch of instructional events kind of connected together until eventually you assess the students. Um, games can even be used in, uh, for assessment purposes. Next. I can't, um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of questioning using questions with your students. Remember that digital games will never replace a teacher. They are uh, they are tools, they are virtual environments, but they are not teachers. They might be able to give information, but they are not educators. They are not. Um, the only thing that changes with the teacher is the role, what role they take in the um, learning experiences. Um, and questioning is absolutely a vital tool when it comes to this. Um, good questions help establish context, make real-world connections, address uh, learning outcomes, and also, of course, they can make their uh, connections to their experiences and to other subject areas and ideas. Next. Um, just remember, too, that to simply ingest their media, they want to use their newly acquired knowledge to create media products. Um, they want to become what, not producers, not consumers, but prosumers. Uh, this provides facilitators with an authentic academic artifact that is easily assessed and linked to student evaluation. So obviously, if you're a prosumer, you're not only, of course, taking in the content, but you're also making something with it, which is definitely high-order thinking skills. Next. So of course, gaming. Uh, Educational gaming, learning with games, um, really helps with what I uh, with formative assessment, uh, because really you can use it in some asse uh, summative assessment approaches. Obviously, uh, it will help you to review for summative assessments for testing. Uh, absolute uh, people use ga um, game platforms like Kahoot and those Jeopardy games with PowerPoint. They use that a lot for review for testing. And absolutely, there have been a lot of studies when it comes to repetition as helping to learn. It, um, it's brain-based, and it absolutely has a place when it comes to for a test. But the real, um, the real reward would be for using gaming with formative assessment. That is, that the game almost becomes a form of formative assessment, because it's constantly giving feedback. That's what's different about sum of assessment. Usually it's one and done, and the sub, um, sum of assessment usually ends the cycle of, of learning. It's usually you're done. With formative assessment, it almost becomes, as you can see, that, that circle uh, where you start off with the standards. You have the target instruction, informed teaching, data analysis, responding to data, and of course then it starts over again. So this testing, uh, uh, teaching the students, testing the students, giving them feedback, and then they go back to the beginning again. That's what's really going on during this gaming cycle. Uh, they're constantly being assessed. Uh, and it's this formative assessment because it gives them that feedback. Next. Um, technology systems such as computers, gaming consoles, and mobile devices easily collect user data. In fact, right now it's a big hot topic in education because of student data uh, and how it's being managed, how it's being, um, uh, how it's being protected. Um, 
on the good side, on the flip side, uh, it, it's helped what's called uh, learning analytics. So in gaming, every choice, every decision, every answer, and every experience the player makes is logged and stored automatically. <laughs> Uh, this unbelievable access to raw data has created a powerful mathematical science known as data analytics. Um, you probably have experienced this at Amazon. When you go on there and if you make a purchase and what happens, well, it knows every book you've ordered. It suggests the next book that you might want to get. Uh, it remembers what uh, uh, computer laptop bag cart that you bought three years ago. That's data analytics. Uh, well, when it comes to gaming, they're starting to take the games and this analytics and start to marry them together to where they're having this type of assessment platform where the students play the game and it of course keeps a record of the information and how they perform. And the nice thing is it gives you feedback. My son, who's eight years old, uh, does a game called uh, does a intervention program called Extra Math. And what he does is he plays a game for about 15 or 20 minutes to constantly do that repetition when it comes to the math skills. When it comes to analytics, his mother and I receive an email with his performance for the week. Uh, it's very big brother kind of, uh, uh, it's very kind of big brother feeling, but it's nice to know that my son is getting this information. So that is definitely a hot topic that there's a lot of debate about but think about the potential and power to help with students. As you can see in the bottom of the slide, there's Teachly. Uh, Teachly uh, produced two apps that I know of right now. Uh, one is Mount Plus, and the second is Atomal Adventures, which uh, helps students to explore addition and multiplication. Now, if you remember what I said about CAP, there's two types of games. There's a te teaching game and a testing game. Well, Teachly, these apps marry those two types of um, games together. It not only teaches students, but then afterwards it tests them. Uh, and it collects this information, and that's where we talk about learning analytics. When it comes to assessment, these type of games, it's called stealth assessment. Because a lot of times what happens is they don't know they're being assessed. So that's stealth assessment, and uh, it's being able to collect. And a lot of the gaming platforms are now starting to do this. They're starting to collect, capture information because they know teachers have to teach. And they also have accountability issues where they have to show that their students are progressing. And this is a way that they're doing it. Um, so Teachly is out there. They are, they are definitely on the Apple App Store. I'm not sure about Google Play. Uh, but they, uh, they're down there. By the way, their apps are free. Those two apps, I'm pretty sure, are free. Um, I downloaded and played with it. Fun. It starts off with teaching, and then it goes into testing, and, it, and it's performance based. So it, it, it's over time too, over progression. So you see how your students are doing. Yeah, I just wanted to say while you were on Teachly, is that I'm those, <laughs> sorry, those two games were developed through um, NSF and uh, Department of Education grants. So that's one of the reasons why they're free. And, and Teachly was exploring, you know, through those grants, is it possible to really engage kids, you know, in a learning activity and at the same time assess them so that you don't have to take extra time out to assess kids. And, um, and the, the results that was they develop, uh, part of getting a, a government grant is not only do you have to develop the software, but you have to, you have to have an independent uh, resource testing the software as well and uh, and they came through with, with flying colors so uh, for uh, I think both games are geared for elementary students correct uh, both teach these yes. games so um, so I'd say that you know if you're an elementary teacher you should and I and I really do believe that the games are really just for iOS it's it's one thing that you should check out is, is the teach the games and, and try them out on your students. I'll come back down. I just I just couldn't. No, it's 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 quite all right. Thank you. It, it's I have befriended Rachel, one of the um, who's one of the developers, and um, really nice, and was able to help me with a lot of uh, uh, my future books, and was able to show me exactly. We connected at ISTE, so I'm hoping that some of you will 
be able to come to ISTE in Philadelphia. It's just a few weeks away, um, but that's exactly the type if you're interested in gaming. Um, there's a lot of, it's one of the hot topics now. You're starting to see a lot more. Um, I'll be offering a workshop um, and also uh, a poster session there if you ever want to, if you're in ISTE in Philadelphia this year. It's at the end of this month for a few days, um, so in Philadelphia. So hopefully I'll see you there. Um, let's go ahead and move along to next. So using uh, digital games during the learning and assessment profit, uh, process can add a great deal of motivation and game for learners. I think we've established that by now. As time moves on, moves on, the sheer number of produced games will continue to grow. The quality of the games will improve even more than the cinematic quality titles we already have out there. Um, and uh, you can, and uh, people are obviously picking them up more and more as hobbies. They're starting to game a lot more as a hobby. I mean, as I mentioned last week, it is a big business. It is an $82 billion a year business projected to be well over $100 million in the next year or two. Um, as for education, digital games will continue to creep into classrooms uh, after classroom as educators leverage their immersive and engaging manner with the always-on generation. Uh, as a cautionary note, I want to say this, that digital games should never be overutilized in schools the appeal for both students and teachers instead educational gaming should um, become another approach for educators to consider um, adding into their toolbox of teaching strategies um, so pulled out when the time and learning situation calls for it uh, and if people have a few more questions in a moments I will answer any questions that you might have we can also have like little big questions in a moment um, but um, I did promise some people some key takeaways, and I know that Mitch also wants to give away a copy of uh, using digital games. I'm sorry, making schools a game worth playing. Um, so what I want to do a key takeaway next is that I want you to have fun if you are a teacher and you're using them in schools, or if you're a game developer and you're building them. Have fun with the kids when you try to play with the kids. See how they react, how they respond. Um, that's what's nice about having to pilot the gameplay is you get to actually play with them. And that's extremely valuable with them because they can see that you like to play with them too. Um, challenge them uh, to defeat you in the game because in the end, next, um, we will make schools a game worth playing. Uh, so what I want to do is show you uh, two slides ahead, Mitch. There we go. So it's time for takeaways. Um, I love to give session participants freebies um, because I was, you know, poor teacher and now I'm an even poor liberal arts professor. Um, so I don't have a new iWatch for you, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but I do have some nuggets of awesomeness for you. Next, I have become a pack rat. So anything I find when it comes to gaming, I collect. Uh, I have hundreds of articles in this Evernote public folder. Um, it, as you can see the website um, on the page, it is filled with hundreds of articles, um, gaming ideas, everything that a teacher. It is filled up with a book. So if you feel like you don't want to spend any money on my books, then don't spend any money on our books. Go ahead and use this free resource um, for you. It's, it's great, um, and I do update it regularly. So it's filled with, uh, I can't remember how many this one's filled with, but I've been taking resources over the past six years and, and finding them and putting them into this um, Evernote public folder. If you're not a big fan of Evernote, you should really become a fan of it. Next. Okay, next present. Here is a site. What I've done is I've started to, I know that the process for finding games sometimes uh, you know, you have to research. And sometimes it's even a bit of luck. Well, I can't stand that. So what I've done is I've started this little pro uh, passion project of mine where I go around and I find uh, digital games and I curate them and I put them up onto what I call my digital learning game database. I have 20 pages of games, uh, so it's well over 100 now, of games that is being 
top-notch games that are instructional. They teach something. Uh, it's organized by the game. It tells you what type of platform it is. It gives you a link so that you could research the game. It gives you a game description. Tells you what subjects are involved with the gameplay. And I also do what's called concept tags, where I actually put what type of information is being learned during the game. Uh, there's the website, and it is being updated regularly. In fact, uh, after this is done, I'm going to put about three or four more games up there. I have a few uh, graduate students or, that are working with me on this project where they're adding all of these games. Um, and I try to mix it up to where their games, I'd say probably 95% or 100% of these games are free. Uh, but if it's paid, I'm trying to add a little column in there where I'll say what it's cost. Um, so that is takeaway number two. So if you have a game, you have a concept you're interested in using, you would take a look at the database, there might be a game there for you. I'm trying to expand beyond just the simple ones like math. There's a lot of mark, a lot of math out there in the, the gaming market right now. I'm trying to find other really good games uh, that are just going beyond math. So I'll keep on doing math, but other subject area too. Um, next. Now, if you are a fan of this, this database, I want to try and make this more participatory. So I want to try and get people to actually help me. Maybe you have a game that you really like that you've used with students. Um, maybe you've heard of a game that has the potential to be a good learning game. Um, what I've done here is I've created a um, just a simple form that captures that information. If you're interested in sharing, go to this web form. There's the web address right there. Uh, you would enter the title. You would give me the platform students would play it on. Just a small little description, a URL, uh, a URL link so that I could research it. It can be added to this, uh, this game database. As I mentioned before, uh, we're constantly adding to this as we find games. Um, there are good sources out there. Mitch shared with me last week a couple good sources that review games. There's Common Sense Media. Uh, but I, I really want to have a game that's been evaluated by educators and suggested by educators. Um, Common Sense Media does a wonderful job of that too, but that's not their main focus. This is to share these games with you. Uh, next. And before we wrap uh, raffle off the book. I just wanted to share my Twitter handle, my email address, and also InfoSavvy21. Uh, I am working with um, an educational think tank where we're trying to do uh, more things. We host a blog, we run presentations and workshops uh, across the country, so feel free to contact me if you want to do anything when it comes to gaming, writing, uh, doing workshops, initiating something, if you even want to just chat it in at your disposal.